Welcome to Peterborough Matters. My name is Paul Rellinger and I'm joined, of course, by Mayor Diane Terry. And it's been a few weeks uh, since we uh, last chatted, Diane, but uh, a lot has happened, uh, as it usually does. Um, and in, in one area in particular, uh, because it is front of mind, um, COVID and uh, a lot of developments there. Um, Peterborough has now been uh, a few weeks into stage three. Uh, we haven't had uh, knock on wood, a new okay. COVID case uh, since I believe it, it's about June 20th. Um, a, as we progress into uh, further along into stage three, um, your thoughts, are, are, are you happy with what you're seeing? Are you hearing of any particular concerns? I know, for example, uh, in the GTA and some other areas, bars have been a big concern, and I'm wondering if that's the same here. Yeah, absolutely. I know that um, while we were, you know, very happy to be able to move into phase three, it's a testament to how uh, serious people in the community have been have been taking it. And, um, you know, there was a lot of concerns over the last couple months, first with, you know, the May long weekend and then the Canada Day long weekend about uh, seasonal residents and, um, you know, people coming through Peterborough City and County, uh, that that might lead to a spike. And again, knock on wood, that didn't quite bear, bear out the way that we had feared it that it would. Um, so certainly we're very happy to be able to move into phase three, particularly with the ability to reopen a lot of amenities. I know parents are very grateful that splash pads and playgrounds are reopening so that there's those opportunities to, um, to entertain kids who have been, you know, bored at home for many, many months now. Um, I know that bars, I was speaking with Dr. Salvatera, that certainly um, you know, was a big concern. Uh, part of, the, you know, the issue with the reopening of just the, those indoor spaces in general is around, um, you know, there is a mandatory masking bylaw coming, or not bylaw, but directed from the health unit coming into effect August 1st. A lot of stores uh, have been, you know, uh, going by a, a mandatory, you know, no mask, no service kind of policy for a while anyways. Um, but with bars and, and restaurants, it's really hard to, you know, kind of keep tabs on people. The, the point of going to a bar is often to sort of socialize and to yeah. wander around. And, and so to, you know, to have people sort of sit if they get up to wear a mask and, the, you know, the burden for that enforcement falls on servers that are, you know, generally making minimum wage. And, um, and so that's, you know, a tricky thing too. Uh, the patios we've seen have been, I think as far as I know, working quite well. Uh, we know that outdoors, there's more ventilation, there's less you know, likelihood of it. So I know that there's concern about the, um, the reopening of those more confined indoor spaces. I know that a lot of, uh, a lot of the restaurants and bars in, in Peterborough that I've seen have been holding off on reopening the indoor spaces because again, they wanna make sure that it's safe, that they can do it right. And if not, they're just not gonna do it. And so, um, and again, it's, you know, we've had a really hot summer, so the, you know, patio, it's been good patio weather, knock on wood. Um, but yeah, very, you know, we're happy to be in, in phase three. And again, it, it just trying to, as we've been doing all along, communicating that that doesn't mean that things are back to normal. Uh, that we still do, you know, even though we haven't had, you know, new cases in uh, over uh, about a month now, uh, again, really good work on behalf of everybody in the, in the community. Um, but we've seen that that can change. We saw it with our neighbors in Kingston and, you know, we see what's happening with our neighbors down south. And so, again, it's just, we do have to be cautious um, and not sort of, you know, get, you know, get too carefree with trying to get back to normal. Yeah, and, and that's where the, it, the slippery slope, I suppose, comes in because while we want to see those numbers, um, go down and, and, you know, we have zero cases, as you said, for over a month. We're all very happy about that, but in, in a roundabout way, it kind of sends the message that, hey, we're out of the woods here, you know, we're good. So you really have to temper that. And, and that's, a, that's a tricky thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think people have been, you know, there was a lot of concern a couple of weeks ago was getting a lot of emails about, you know, people wanting there to be a, you know, a face covering um, order. There's uh, most of the health units around us and other municipalities around us have implemented that. Um, and again, because I think people remember what it was like in March and April and want to make sure that we don't have to go back to that. And again, it's, 
you know, we're going into August. A lot of uh, people are, are traveling, uh, you know, mostly in province this summer, but still there's movement between different regions and, um, it, you know, and people sort of, again, thinking, okay, well, maybe we can have a couple people over for dinner or maybe we can go visit, you know, and, and then again, we just, we just do need to be careful. But uh, I think people are still being very vigilant about it um, and we just need to keep, you know, getting that message out there. Uh, you mentioned the uh, mandatory uh, face covering order that has come from the public health unit. Um, your thoughts on that? We're, we're, you know, I know, I know the uh, Dr. Rosanna Salvatera consulted with uh, municipal leaders before uh, going ahead with that step. Uh, you're on side with that? Were, were there any particular concerns around that for you? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and there was, you know, consultation, the, the um, you know, we've been working very closely with the county and Hiawatha and Curve Lake, the, the regions that fall under the Peterborough um, health unit umbrella. And we wanted to make sure that we had, you know, a, a consistent approach across the region, because again, there's so many people that live in the county and work in the city and vice versa. And so, um, you know, the health unit was really good there. There was a big uh, sort of summit that we had a couple weeks ago with uh, all the county leaders and First Nation leaders and, and the health unit to talk about it. Um, I think, you know, the, the the biggest concern for a lot of us was around enforcement. And we kind of talked about that a little bit just before um, in terms of, you know, the response, whose responsibility is it to uh, enforce that you have to wear a mask when you're indoors. So if it's you know, in a retail establishment or, a, you know, a restaurant, um, you know, we, unfortunately, that burden is going to often fall to staff who, and we've seen, you know, what, what happens when there's people that are adamantly opposed to being told to wear a mask, people can get very angry about it. Um, and, you know, so you're putting workers in, you know, potentially a situation that is a bit dangerous. And so, um, what we're doing and what we've done, I think, all along uh, for various, you know, best practices that have been using an education, um, you know, an education campaign first, uh, you know, really strongly encouraging people to wear masks, demonstrating, you know, what that looks like, making sure that they're available uh, for free for folks who might not be able to access or afford them. So on transit and at other places like that. Um, you know, certainly people are able to ask staff for, for a mask and, and receive one. Um, so that's, you know, definitely the way that we're trying to approach this for now. And I think it is becoming more sort of normalized. We're seeing it in, in other communities uh, as well, most of our neighboring municipalities. Um, so, so we'll see how it goes again as we continue moving in, into phase three and as the, you know, as the policy comes into full force on August 1st. And it's funny how we, you touched on a point there that <laughs> it's funny how we think as humans, when, when we're told to do something, we don't want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> but when, when we're not told to do something, we all think it's a great idea. So yeah, yeah. I, I get what you're saying about the dilemma around masks and forcing people versus. Yeah. And there's, you there. know, and Dr. Salvatera outlines, you know, there are exemptions. Obviously there are some people, you know, kids shouldn't be wearing masks if they, you know, they're not going to wear them properly. There are people that have uh, medical reasons or, or physical reasons why they, they can't. Um, and so we're again, trying to, you know, tell people not to sort of mask shame people when they're out because you never know what's going on behind the scenes. Um, but certainly if you are able to, and you, you know, uh, then we just ask you to use that common courtesy and common sense, because it, again, it's more about protecting others and it is about protecting yourself um, yeah. because it sort of keeps that, you know, the bacteria and any potential um, droplets from, you know, you know, dissipating in the air. I, I'm really surprised we're not at that point where we've seen advertising on mass yet or, uh, or election signs even. <laughs> <laughs> Give it time. Give it time. It's only Give a matter states, of time. I think. Um, as you're well aware, the, the jump from stage one to stage two, and even the stage three came relatively quickly, uh, to, you know, for the regions that were allowed to. I, I'm guessing the jump from stage three to four is a bigger leap than what we've seen, only in terms of what that may entail, in terms of larger crowds, um, you know, your, your festivals, uh, the Memorial Center, 
I imagine some of those things may come under a stage four call and we're, you know, not to be a gloomy gust, but we're a long ways away from that situation where we're in stage four. And no one really knows when that's going to happen. But having said that, Diane, are, are, is the city looking ahead even that far? Uh, for example, um, the OHL season is scheduled to begin in September. Have you heard anything from the OHL about what their plans are and how that affects the Peets? So I haven't heard directly from the OHL. I know that uh, staff, you know, are, are keeping a close eye on what's happening there. Um, but I think you're right. The you know we're going to be in phase three for a while. Um, you know, it, you know. Again, it's hard to say how long. Um, but I know that staff are you know on top of the work that they do in normal times have been monitoring changes and, and best practices and it was it was easier to, in a lot of respects to close things down a couple months ago than it has been to reopen because there's all these new protocols in place so city hall is going to be reopening um in a week or so uh and uh, so when you're in there you'll see some changes they've been installing you know the plexiglass and the markers on the floor the the dividers and arrows and that kind of thing so um, it, you know, it takes a lot of coordination. It takes a lot of money to order these new supplies to make sure that we're providing proper protective equipment for not just the staff, but also the residents that come in. So it's been, uh, it's been a challenge for sure. But um, again, everybody in Ontario and in Canada is sort of feeling our way through this together. And so, you know, there are municipalities in, in Ontario that are still in phase two but there are most of us that are in phase three and um, are sort of sharing again, ideas and what's working and what's not working and um, mm. how to make sure that we can keep moving in that positive direction. Okay, um, well, we've talked about COVID uh, as we uh, typically do uh, during these crazy times. Uh, we're gonna come back after this break and uh, talk about uh, non COVID stuff, uh, <laughs> some, some goings on at city council. You're watching Peterborough Matters, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Peterborough Matters. My name is Paul Rellinger, and of course, I'm joined by Mayor Diane Terrian. Um, Diane, nothing really seems to stir up council debate like a, a pay raise or even the suggestion of a pay raise for, for the mayor and members of council. Uh, we recently saw a clear example of that. Um, Councillor uh, Henry Clark, uh, who didn't want to take the pay raise, which is his prerogative, uh, decided that he would give that that money, I believe it was around $300 it amounted to, uh, to uh, COVID measures to help the city. Uh, I, I guess sending a message that, you know, we don't need a raise and we should be, we should be helping the cause. And uh, you really took umbrage with that. And maybe you could just uh, touch on that very briefly. Yeah, I mean, certainly it does stir up debate. And I mean, there was a few things, um, you know, there was an attempt to bring that forward twice by by the, by Councillor Clark, and it was ruled out of order at the at the meetings. Um, and, you know, I, and Councillor Zippel posted a, a really interesting blog post um, about it. And again, you know, we're talking about, you know, the, the cost of living increase. It, it's not really a raise. It's not like we're giving ourselves a raise. Um, but I think part of the problem was, you know, there had been discussion behind the scenes um, about, about it. And, you know, Councillor Clark had let us know that he um, wanted to, to bring it forward. Again, it got ruled out of order. So then, you know, it ended up in the media. So we brought it forward through other, other means. Um, you know, and I, it's, it is a touchy subject because there are people that, you know, think that we should be doing this work for free. Um, you know, which just the reality of the day and age is that, you know, people, people can't do this work for free. And, you know, a, you know, there are some folks for whom, um, and a lot of us had said, we we're happy to give up that cost of living increase. Um, but we kind of wanted to keep it more private because there's not, you know, not all counselors have, you know, are retired or had a, you know, solid career where they have a pension. There's some that are a lot of us that are still working. Um, there's a lot that are self-employed and have been, their businesses have been closed for, for four months. So, um, you know, it's, uh, everybody's financial situation is different. And again, it's not a lot of money. Um, but again, you know, trying to, 
you know, publicly shame people into doing that when you don't always know people's financial situations is something that's, you know, that I find a bit problematic. Um, and then, you know, again, there's the bigger discussion about, about, um, value, you know, the work that you, that, that we do and that, you know, you want these offices to be accessible to people who don't normally do them. Um, you know, because I've heard from a, a lot of folks that they would be interested in running for city council. Um, but it's, they can't afford to do it if they're, you know, a single parent or if they are, you know, to take time off work, to run a campaign, to do all those things. Um, and so you do want to compensate people for, for their work. Uh, you know, and then it's also been, again, a bit of a distraction from some of the stuff that we've been trying to focus on with recovery, with um, this crazy budget that we're dealing with. Uh, luckily, you know, we did hear from the province and the feds yesterday that they've come to, uh, I think it was yesterday, <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yes, last it night was a long meeting, yeah. um, you know, an, an agreement to help fund municipalities uh, for, because we're all dealing with these budget shortfalls. Um, so, you know, uh, it was just, you know, it's been a crazy couple of months. And so I just, uh, again, to, you know, yeah, just think that yeah. there's a, f a few issues with how, how that, that came about. And again, some of us just wanted, to, would prefer to make donations to various charities um, as a private matter. Yeah, a, a bit of a sideshow, no question. And, uh, and, uh, and, and a, a distraction. Um, and, and, you know, I, not to belabor the point, but, uh, I think it was a few years ago, the provincial government changed the pay of school trustees. And I think they capped it at $5,000 a year for a school trustee, but there were trustees who had, you know, were making almost six figures. They had their own car, their own driver. Uh, I mean, it obviously got out of control. So yeah, it's a fine line between, you know, making sure it's worth people's while to do it but not making sure they get rich off, off the public. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Public. And I mean, when, you know, city council, and it didn't used to pay back in the day, um, you know, when it, but it start. you know, when city councils first started, it was generally like the local businessmen that sort of just formed city council. And so again, if you want that diversity of, of experience and, you know, opinion and that kind of thing, um, you do need to pay for it. And I mean, you know, in terms of the city budget, it basically, you know, every resident for a dollar a year is getting two counselors and a mayor, yeah. um, which yeah. I think is a pretty good deal. But <laughs> some <laughs> people might argue that. Um, yeah. But we do um, have a lot of challenges with the budget, like we've heard, and we had a, a marathon meeting last night, and we had a marathon finance committee meeting a couple weeks ago where uh, you know, council couldn't come to consensus on a budget guideline. So it's going to be a really interesting fall. Um, you know, staff are working hard and, you know, kudos to staff because they do a lot of work behind the scenes that, you know, people don't necessarily see, but they're with us until 2.30 in the morning with those meetings um, yep. and, uh, you know, helping uh, d delegates get through, get onto the line, um, dealing with some, you know, people that are you know cursing at them if they if their phone doesn't work exactly how it should so um just wanted to give a little shout out to the staff there and and you folks in the media who are doing the same thing for sure and uh you mentioned the uh the long long meeting uh that you uh just experienced long council meeting you and your council colleagues uh i believe you said there was something like 42 delegations many of those delegations uh had to do with the uh, apartment building development at uh, Armour Road and I believe Cunningham Boulevard. That's correct. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. I attended their rally. I guess you could call it a protest, but they had a big rally on July 16th. Um, and I have to say, in, in all the time I've been here and I've been to many, many different rallies and protests for many different things, very, very well organized. This is a pretty determined group. Um, Obviously, the zoning change I, I has gone through, um, and uh, what your so, thoughts on that whole situation? I guess it was zoned commercial. They wanted to keep it commercial. Now it's zoned residential. They're concerned about traffic. They're concerned about the fact there really isn't a lot of commercial development along that stretch of of road between. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, so last I'll night let you go, I'll let you speak on it. <laughs> uh, because last night there was a deferral um, for a traffic study. So the, you know, there was 
several concerns brought forward by, by the, the neighborhood. Um, I mean, again, it's not the city's, you know, you know we, we do have to be building and planning our cities in the best way. Um, you know, things do get rezoned all the time from commercial to residential, vice versa, you know, all over the city that does happen. And that area has been rezoned a few times. Um, and so, you know, I understand that there's, you know, not commercial amenities up there, but I mean, it's a new subdivision. Folks move there knowing that there weren't, you know, those amenities. So, you yeah. know, that's, it's not something that the city can force a developer to do. We can't say you have to have a grocery store here, you're not allowed to do anything. Right. Um, because again, if things fall within the uh, confines and they fall in line with the Provincial Planning Act, then staff recommends it and council, um, you know, approves it. And if we yeah. deny it, then we get taken to the Land Planning Appeals Tribunal. So, uh, you know, there are concerns about, about traffic. I mean, infrastructure, we know across Peterborough uh, is uh, old and you know needs to be upgraded. Uh, certainly, Armour Road in that area. There's it's the one through fare for that for that neighborhood. Um, and so, there were two. There was motions to defer one about the traffic study, which passed, and another one which unfortunately didn't pass, which was around evaluating the wetland um, that is the Thompson Creek uh, wet, wetland that is in that proximity. Um, so that didn't, did not pass. Um, but, you know, I think, again, the, you know, the neighborhood d did have a very coordinated campaign. Um, there's, there is a lot of development happening in, in East City. I mean, part of it is that other areas, you know, in, like, so for example, downtown and people will say, well, high density needs to go downtown, but it, under the Places to Grow Act, under our OP, high density needs to go all over the city, not just downtown. Um, and so that is something that is going to be happening more frequently. Um, and I know that there is a lot of, uh, again, opposition to change in general, but, um, I think, you know, that we'll see what happens with that development going forward. There's a few other developments in that, in that area too, as, as you probably know, that are going to be forthcoming. Yep. Um, but higher um, density is the way to go. And, and I guess adding, you know, I'll just leave it at this. I guess adding to the residents' uh, angst is the fact that there's been a sign there on that site promising commercial for quite a while. So I think a simple thing is taking down the damn sign. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably would go a long way. Wouldn't be that hard to do. Yeah. So it, it wouldn't be hard that that hard to do at all. Um, I wanted to also talk about a, a development that's been getting a lot of media attention. The city is bringing in a bylaw. Um, that bans um, symbols of racism, public displays of racism. Um, where's that at right now? Maybe you could, I know it's been proposed, but uh, has that been approved? And give me the thinking behind that. This includes obviously uh, rebel flags, uh, Confederate flags, um, uh, Nazi Germany flags, which Washington people Coast. fly for whatever reason. Um, and uh, an interesting side note, just before you give me your answer, is that the criminal code as it stands right now does not prohibit the flying of flags. It's not a, uh, an offense. Where it does become an offense is when a flag is used uh, in connection with an act of racism or hatred, uh, and then a charge can be laid. But anyway, uh, where, where's that at, and, and what's the thinking behind it? So that uh, got, that proposal got approved last night or, or later this morning, <laughs> uh, earlier this morning. Um, at our council meeting. And so that, uh, that proposal came forward, I believe it was Councillor Pappas and Councillor Vasliadis who, who, who drafted that um, in response to, you know, a lot, uh, you know, we have seen a few incidences of, um, you know, hate symbols being graffitied on, on places uh, in the city and county. And, you know, again, yeah, rebel flags being flown, even though we're nowhere near the US South and even then, um, it's, yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but basically, you know, we, there's been a series of steps over the last year by this council, including signing the Declaration of Inclusive Municipalities, um, you know, working, trying to work with police to address some of the concerns that folks have about uh, some of the, you know, systemic racism that, that 
it, you know, is a problem in, in some policing institutions. And so this was something that, you know, and I can't speak to, you know, Councillor Vassiatis and Councillor Pappas's um, thinking per se, um, but the idea was that, you know, we have had a few complaints or concerns from residents about some of these um, symbols. And we, I mean, even just yesterday, there was, you know, somebody that was defacing um, posters downtown with swastikas. So, you know, just wanting to make it known that it's not acceptable, that it's not something that's tolerated, um, and that it does need to be called out, uh, not just by city council, but certainly we're willing to, to lead that, but by residents as well. And they, they know that we've got their back on, on, on fighting against that symbols of hate and injustice. And as you're well aware, of course, uh, city, uh, the city is so much more uh, diverse, so much multiculturalism here. It's one of the things that makes Peterborough great. Uh, so yeah, the timing is good and this is something that needs to be done. We thank you all so very much for watching Peter Rowe Matters. I thank you, Diane. Please stay safe. And uh, we'll see all of you in a few weeks' time. Thank you.